Hey, welcome. We're talking about money scripts. I love talking about money scripts. It's a topic that we've researched quite extensively. And I want to share with you the results of our studies on money scripts, as well as the four categories of money scripts that have emerged from the research. And at this point, it's been research done on tens of thousands of people. So let's dive right in. So as I mentioned, this is a test we have used in research studies lots of studies and it's being used right now all over the world but if you wanted to take the exact same test it's the clants money script inventory all you have to do is go to moneyscripts.com it's it's my website you can take the test and the results will be emailed to you automatically so if you want to look at your financial psychology very specifically based on the items of the clants money script inventory i'd encourage you to go there and take the test you might even want to pause the video now and do it so let's talk about where money scripts fall in the whole theory of financial psychology when it comes to our relationship with money. What's the role that money scripts have? Well, one of the models I like to look at is this triangle. And essentially, when you want to understand your financial psychology, these are the elements for us to really look at and try to understand. The first is our financial flashpoints. And there's a lot to be said about that. Um, probably an entire course, but essentially they are the early experiences you have around money. And sometimes these experiences happen to your parents, sometimes your grandparents, sometimes your great grandparents. But our experiences around money lead to our money scripts. And that's going to be the topic of discussion in this bonus section. And these beliefs around money, which we get from our family, from sometimes down our generational line, then predict our financial behaviors and our financial outcomes. But what are money scripts? Money scripts are multi-generational. So these are beliefs around money that we quite often inherit from our parents, our grandparents, and our great-grandparents. And part of my journey has been really trying to understand that family history. And so I sat down and I interviewed my parents and I asked about stories about my grandparents and my great-grandparents. And it's amazing to hear all these stories because all of a sudden it'll help you really understand your emotions around money, your hangups around money, and even your successes around money. So if you have the opportunity to do some of that multi-generational digging and asking your parents about stories and your grandparents and what was it like for them growing up around money, definitely capitalize on it because it's an incredible, incredibly insightful experience. So they're multi-generational. And many of these money scripts are developed in childhood with a childlike mind, which is really important to consider. A childlike mind doesn't really look for all the nuances. It's trying to understand and make sense of the environment. And so we'll, we'll have an experience. And um, for example, let's say that we run across somebody who has money and they're rude. And we might be like, ooh, people who drive Mercedes are rude. Rich people are rude. And since we don't really talk about money, that ends up being a partial truth that's clanking around our subconscious mind. And we don't really have a chance to examine, is that really accurate? Was that just a one-time deal? So a lot of these beliefs, when we develop them in childhood, we don't really have the opportunity to challenge them and change them and tweak them so that they're more accurate, especially around money, which is a taboo topic. They're also typically subconscious. So as I'm talking about these money scripts and going over these categories, and if you went, went ahead and took the test at moneyscripts.com, you're going to realize that you know you're not consciously aware of all these beliefs and so that, that's why those prompts are there to try to draw this out of you um, and so many of these beliefs we're not really even aware we have them we just think that's just how life works that's how the world works what's also really interesting about money scripts is they're always partially true so there are parts that are false but there's always an element of truth like for example some wealthy people are jerks Absolutely. So there's that element of truth. And these beliefs don't arrive out of nowhere. They arrive out from specific situations that were valid and true. But the problem is that they're typically only partially true. And so, for example, around that people who drive Mercedes are jerks. Um, some people who drive Mercedes are jerks. That, that, is, that makes it more accurate. Whereas some people are delightful human beings who are doing incredible things in the world. And it, it might even be you. Um, and so that, that's the problem with money scripts. They tend to be partially true. But our brains will operate as if it's entirely true. And that's when they can become destructive and limiting in terms of our own financial success. Money scripts can also be resistant to change. The more emotion we have attached to these beliefs, the harder it is to change. And so this is where trauma can come into it. Like for example, if you grew up poor, that can be a very traumatic experience. And so the belief that there's not gonna be enough money might be really, really tough to shake because you, you went to sleep afraid at night, hungry, anxious. And so even if you do live in a, in a time of abundance where you do have money, you might have this deep-seated fear that never goes away. And it's a real challenge. And so they can be resistant to change. We have a bunch of emotion attached to them. And that's where 
talking to a therapist, that's where going through experiences like you're going through right now can help shake and shake up that emotional attachment and loosen it so that we can become more accurate in our thinking and more flexible in our thinking, which really is a key indicator for financial health. And the other thing is that money scripts drive our financial behaviors. And so the craziest financial behavior makes perfect sense when you understand the money script. They also tend to be culturally bound. So what we'll notice is that certain groups of people tend to have certain beliefs around money. For example, the savings rate in Japan is, is astronomical compared to that in the United States. It's like around 30%. And you have to sit and wonder what's going on there culturally What's going on with how they're teaching children and, and they're just, in, so what are they immersed in, in terms of their attitudes towards money? Because you compare it to the United States, it's, we're, we're saving a fraction. And so we see that among cultures. We see that among socioeconomic group cultures, just strictly socioeconomic groups operate as different cultures and will have different beliefs around money. So they're definitely culturally bound, which makes it really interesting for you to understand your own culture and where you come from. And it, it also makes it interesting to learn about other cultures because sometimes by learning how other people look at the world and, and see the world, it can shine a light on things you're not even knowing about how you're operating in your own life. So when it comes to money scripts, our financial behaviors and our money disorders make perfect sense when we understand the money scripts that drive them. And so now I'm going to share with you the four categories of money scripts that we have discovered in our research. And not to get too nerdy about it, but we developed tests to study changes in beliefs around money. And we drew money beliefs from hundreds and hundreds of clients, put it into a very large list, administered that list to thousands of people. And then we ran statistical analyses on it to see what patterns emerged. And we found four main patterns of money scripts. And as I'm talking about these, I want you to think about yourself. I want you to think about your partner, your family, your, your siblings, and see where you sort of fall into these categories. And I'm going to be sharing with you what the categories are, some of the specific beliefs, and some of the specific consequences and outcomes of those beliefs based on the research. The first category is what we call money avoidance. Money avoidance are beliefs like rich people are greedy. People get rich by taking advantage of others. Money corrupts people. Good people shouldn't care about money. There's, there's a virtue in having less money. Now, very clearly, this is a negative association with money. And what I know for a fact is if you have these beliefs somewhere in your history, either your personal history, your family history, you've run across wealthy people who were doing bad things, who were nefarious characters. This doesn't arise out of nowhere. These beliefs come from legitimate sources. Now, it's only part of the truth. It's only part of the truth. Like my goal for you is I want you to become extremely wealthy and, and do incredibly good things in the world. And there are a lot of examples of that in our culture. But if you have this belief, chances are when you see some of that, you'll be doubting it and you'll be saying, oh, they're just doing it for a tax break or they have some nefarious reason for doing this. So this is a really insidious mindset. Very often we get this mindset when we grow up in lower income families. It helps us frankly, feel better about ourselves. You know, it's like, we're not really happy that we don't have money, but if we can vilify people who have more than us, it helps us feel better about ourselves. So that's a little psychological trick we do to ourselves. But the problem with this belief set is it's not entirely accurate and it's associated with you having lower income, lower net worth, being younger, single, and less educated. And by the way, this is a pattern you're going to see, no offense to my younger, single, <laughs> less educated friends, but there's something about being in a relationship with somebody that sort of confronts you and um, getting education, obviously, the, the more you know. And as we get older, we tend to have more balanced beliefs around money. So that's a pattern we're going to see with some of these self-destructive financial beliefs. And, and come on, let's just be honest. Like I was making most of my financial mistakes when I was younger and single. And I think that's a pretty common experience for people. But it's also associated with a bunch of self-destructive financial behaviors. And so this mindset, not good for your financial health, not good for your net worth, not good for your income. And it's something to really look at and, and to try to address and confront if you have these beliefs, because they will totally trip you up. The second category of money scripts is what I called money worship. These are beliefs like money is power. More money will make you happier. Money buys freedom. Things would be better if I had more money. Now, wouldn't things be better if you had more money? <laughs> I think there's an element of truth to this for all of us. The problem with this, though, is we attach it to things, too. And so people with this belief have the belief that if they buy more things and more stuff, it's going to make them happier, which is absolutely not the case. Once you hit that, you know, you're, you're taking care of your basic needs. There really isn't a strong, lasting, significant boost in happiness if you're making, you know, 70000 a year and you're making $200,000 a year. It just doesn't work like that. Money and income in and of itself is not going to solve all your problems. And if you know any ultra wealthy people, you're going to know that, yes, they, they deal with depression. They deal with anxiety. They're human beings. Now, the problem with this belief too, since we're so focused on more stuff, making us happier, 
it tends to associate with lower income, lower net worth, again, being younger, single, and less educated, and a whole host of self-destructive financial behaviors. So we want to not put money too far on a pedestal. For me, the way I look at it is money's a tool. It helps me buy my time. Experiences for me are much more um, associated with happiness than money and stuff I'm buying. Now, money allows me to buy my time so I can have experiences. And so if you've seen me on social media, I have some shirts that say experiences greater than stuff. And that's exactly how I look at it. For me, true wealth is being able to own your time so you can do what you want, when you want, with who you want. It's not about more stuff. And so this money worship mindset, I think it's the average American and it's definitely not good for your financial health. And what you're gonna find out as I talk about that fourth category is that this isn't how wealthy people think. And lastly, this is the category two that we found most associated with higher credit card debt. Because look, we're trying to buy stuff to fill that emotional need and to make ourselves happy. The third category is what we call money status. And this is sort of like the keeping up with the Joneses effect. These beliefs are things like your self-worth equals your net worth. I won't buy something unless it's new. If it's not the best, I'm not going to buy it. Now, what's also interesting is these individuals are more likely to endorse the belief. If you ask me how much money I made, I'd probably tell you I make more than I do. Hmm, what am I doing here? I'm trying to show you that I made it. And what we found is this belief set is more common in people who grew up in poor families. And it's, it's a real common pattern that trips people up. And social media just makes it terrible because on Instagram, we're just inundated with all these pictures of, of like beautiful cars and jewelry, et cetera. Like when I'm doing a lot of, I happen to have this on my desk here. When I'm doing a lot of videos, I, I, I use props to sort of illustrate this desperate desire that many of us who grew up lower income have to show the world we made it. And so we're very vulnerable to buying high status items, which actually decreases our net worth. And what we found in our studies is that's not what most wealthy people do. And money status beliefs are associated again with lower income, lower net worth, being younger, single, and less educated, higher credit card debt, and growing up in poorer homes. So this is another thing we have to guard ourselves against. And popular culture makes this extremely difficult because we're being lied to all the time about how wealthy people spend their money. The fourth category, and by the way, there's a good one, and it's called money vigilance. And this is the money script mindset we want to adopt if we want to become wealthy, because this is the mindset among wealthy individuals. So 80% of millionaires in the United States self-made. How do you become self-made? How are you able to acquire wealth? Well, it starts with a mindset. And this is the mindset. Money should be saved, not spent. It's important to save for a rainy day. I'd be a nervous wreck if I didn't have money saved for an emergency. This is why I called it money vigilance. There's a lot of vigilance there. There's actually some anxiety there. Do you, hear, do you sense that? I'd be a nervous wreck. It's important to save. You got to save. What's also fascinating about this group of individuals is if, if you ask them how much money they made, they would actually tell you they make less than they do. Now, that is a real mind bender. So it's actually the opposite of what you're seeing on social media. These individuals are trying to downplay how much money they have. Isn't that incredible? It's the absolute opposite of what we're seeing on social media. And the problem is, is if you have this belief that rich people spend like that, you're going to look around and find plenty of examples. It's called a confirmation bias, a confirmation bias. I had this bias. I, I thought that's how rich people spent their money. I grew up seeing MTV cribs and, and, and you're, you're shown all these pictures of people who, are, who have all this money and they're buying lavish things. That is not most self-made millionaires. And if you think about it, you don't become a self-made millionaire if you have that spending lavish lifestyle mindset. So we have to really take it with a grain of salt when we see that. Sometimes that's multi-generational money. Sometimes that's people coming into money who are going to end up losing it because they're overspending. And that's a real, real common pattern where people have initial success and then they spend like poor people, frankly, and they end up becoming poor again because they run through all their money. So money vigilance is associated with higher income, higher net worth, lower credit card debt, and higher overall financial health. And so this really is the mindset that I want to instill in you. It's the one that I want to instill in my children. And it's the one that I want to embrace myself because I'd like to climb that socioeconomic ladder. And this is the mindset. This is how you get there. This is how you stay there. And this is how most wealthy people become wealthy and how they stay wealthy is with that money vigilance mindset. I'm gonna wrap it up here with three action items. If you wanted to, to see where you fall in those four categories, go to moneyscripts.com. You can take the test, the same one we use in research. What's so fascinating is we, we will often see people who spike up in a couple different areas. And so for example, and this is fascinating, people score high in that money avoidance, rich people are bad, tend to score high in that money worship. 
which is really fascinating, isn't it? It's like rich people are bad, money is disgusting, but I wish I was rich and I wish I had more money. So don't be surprised if there's some conflicting beliefs in there. And one way to make sense of that is you were raised by two different parents. You've had different experiences. So a lot of us have some conflicting beliefs around money, which just makes it all that more challenging, right? The second thing I want to point you to is, is a handout that I have, um, the top 10 money scripts that mess up people's financial lives. And there I pulled out 10 specific beliefs and talked about them in a little bit more detail in that handout. And in that handout too, I have a couple resources for you there. Um, my latest book that I mentioned, as well as the Financial Health Academy and a special offer. So with that, I want to thank you. I hope you can dive in and look at your money scripts. There's so much power in our ability to transform our financial lives when we understand our financial psychology. Take care.